Hi folks. This video is about the multiple expansion of checkable deposits and it's based on an activity that I designed for my students taking AP economics, particularly the macroeconomics. And um, the activity here is designed to show how um, banks take in checkable deposits and then they lend out excess reserves and how that actually expands the money supply and where that money goes and how it's eventually uh, destroyed um, and also then to explain how uh, the beginnings of the United States Federal Reserve Banking System can uh, limit the growth of the money supply by using something called the reserve ratio which hopefully my class has seen in one of my previous videos um, and if you haven't then I would strongly recommend that you go back to either my YouTube site or go to my Weebly site and take a look at um, the videos general ones devoted to monetary policy. This video assumes you've already had that under your belt. So uh, because this is a, a, one of those tough handouts, I'm going to guide you, you folks through this um, as much as possible. Um, classes, if you want to work with a partner, uh, again, I would, I would recommend that. Um, I'd also recommend you know taking a look at the video uh, and, and pausing it uh, see if you can answer these questions and if you get stuck and if you can't um, I'll answer them for you, unpause it and you, you can see what the answer is and then you can you can check it through that way. Uh, <clears throat> my AP classes if you're struggling with this even after you see the video uh, either ask uh, Mr. Orff some of the questions or you can email me directly. So uh, in the this first example in part A here uh, we're, we're, we're examining um, a bank that has a reserve requirement of 10% of their checkable deposits and then we're showing them what happens to the banks when they lend out their other 90%. Um, we're assuming that um, <clears throat> all the money that's lent out by one bank is, is eventually redeposited in another bank. That's just a general assumption that we make. So um, our answers here then, if, if a new checkable deposit is made for $1,000 and the bank has a 10% reserve requirement, or reserve ratio that's set by the United States Federal Reserve, then how much can Bank One keep as its uh, required reserves? The answer here would be 100. How many can it lead, lend out? The answer here would be 900. How then much will be deposited in bank number two, given our assumption that 100% of the money lent out in one bank ends up in the other bank? Initially, at least, the answer here is 900. How much will then the bank's uh, bank two keep as a, re a required reserve? 900 times 10 percent is 90. How much can it lend out? The answer is 810. And then how much then will be deposited in bank number three? The answer, of course, then is 810. Easy so far, hopefully. Now we're going to head down to the second question. Okay, the second question then um, we're using. Uh, the concepts and some of the answers in, in our previous question to help us complete this this table. We've got to fill in all the blanks here and we're going to uh, round up to the second decimal in this particular case just to make it easy on ourselves. And then uh, after we finish this table we're going to answer some questions below. But let's just take a look now. I'm looking at the first bank there. We're looking at the initial checkable deposit of thousand dollars. We've got uh, the bank having to hold back 10% of its deposit in reserve and that means that the bank then can loan out 900. We take this 900 and we start <clears throat> put it into the second bank and we start our second line. 900, we take 10% of that 900, we can get that answer up in, into our previous question, we've already done that. Uh, that's 90, this blank here, and then that leaves bank number two with $810 that it can loan out. So, uh, you know, where do we start this next line? Well, we just drop this 810 down to this line for bank three because uh, the uh, loans for bank two immediately go to bank three and then bank three has to hold back 10% of its fractional reserves and again this answer here uh, then is after we take the 810 and subtract $81 we get 729 and so forth. So in this particular graph, the, to get the answer to the rest of the questions, you need to work 
horizontally, skip down to the next line, work horizontally, skip down to the next line, work horizontally. The big picture here, before we get into the questions, I want you to realize this, that our initial $1,000 deposit has uh, stimulated $9,000 of loanable funds. So it's expanded the money supply by 9000 which is a very interesting aspect of what banks can do. Now, uh, we're going to pause for a second to make sure that you get these answers and uh, then go down and answer some of the questions based on the graph. And uh, here we go with some of the questions just based on our chart above. Uh, we've got an original, original deposit of $1,000 and that increased bank reserves by $1,000. That's the answer here. Eventually, we found this led to a total of $10,000 expansion of bank deposits. Uh, nine, ten, uh, 1000 which is this number here, of which was because of the original deposit, and then 9000 was because of the subsequent bank lending activities. Uh, if fractional reserve banking had been then 15% instead of 10%, the uh, amount of deposit expansion would have been less than this example. If the fractional reserve had been 5% instead of 10%, the amount of deposit expansion would have been more. If banks had not loaned out all their excess reserves, the amount of deposit expansion would have been less than in this example. And then if all loans had not been redeposited in the banking system, the amount of deposit expansion would have been, again, less. I hope you got all that. The big picture here is that to slow down the money supply, we could increase reserve ratios, as we just have seen in question B here. An increased reserve ratio from 10 to 15 percent would have left less uh, deposit expansion available. If we lower the reserve ratio for, to 5 percent from 10 percent, the amount of deposit expansion would have been more. Something to keep in mind when we take our next step and we really start to evaluate the role of the Federal Reserve and how it can increase and decrease the money supply. Let's continue further on down uh, in our example here. Here we just have a classic, what's called known as a T-sheet. It is a method that banks use to uh, very quickly keep their assets and their liabilities in order. Their assets are things that they own that have value and their liabilities are things that have to be paid out. The question here asks us to use a T-sheet uh, to show how the $1,000 of checkable deposits described in our first question would actually be used. The deposit itself would be entered in as a liability. Why? Because sooner or later the bank will have to pay back that deposit. It's going to take that thousand dollars, hold some in, in reserve, and it's going to loan out the rest. But eventually the bank, whenever we go to take our money out, has got to be good for that thousand dollars because that's the, the point. It's, uh, it's been contracted out to keep that thousand dollars in safekeeping and sooner or later it has to, has to pay that back. So we enter the thousand deposit over here in our liabilities. Now, in terms of our assets, what has the bank done with that thousand dollars? Well, of course, it's loaned out 900 of it, so our first line over here should read 900, and it's had to hold back 10% in reserve. So our next line here over on our assets would be reserves and 100. So we have a nice balance here. We've got $1,000 of liability over here balanced out by 900 of loans and assets and uh, $100 in reserve. Let's move on further down. Okay, moving down to part B of this handout, and uh, we get something called the deposit expansion multiplier. It's another one of these multipliers that we are going to be using and another one that you have to commit to memory. This one's easy though. The deposit expansion multiplier is just simply one over the reserve ratio. So down here in this example, 
if I have a reserve ratio of 10%, I just take 1 over the reserve ratio expressed as a decimal, which is 0 0.1, uh, and that gives me 10. All right, now what this is going to tell me is the, uh, in any given reserve ratio, how much the money supply can expand. And you're giving an example here that um, with a reserve ratio of 10%, as we saw earlier, um, that we could actually, it, the money, the deposit expansion multiplier would then have been 10. And um, we know then that uh, we would have created $9,000 of new loans as a result of my $1,000 in checkable deposits. Let's, uh, let's take a look at our graph, which is the one thing that we have to complete here. Uh, here, all we're going to do is uh, for a reserve ratio of 1%, 5%, 10%, 12.5%, 15%, 25%, uh, just write in here the required reserves if we're assuming $1,000 being deposited into a bank. How much then? We've got to figure out the excess reserves we have to figure out the, de the de deposit expansion multiplier and then the maximum increase in the money supply. Um, I'm going to do the first one for you. With a 1% reserve ratio, the required reserves are only $10 of this $1,000. So $10, $10 goes here. The excess reserves then can, that can be deposited or that can be loaned out are 990. That's simply 1,000 minus the 10. And then the deposit expansion multiplier would be 1 over the reserve ratio, uh, which is 1 over 0 0.01, and that is 100. And that means then the maximum increase in the money supply uh, is uh, we would multiply uh, our 990 in excess reserves by the 100, and we would get $99,000. So uh, we'll move further on down now. And quickly, question number six says, what would happen if the reserve ratio were 10% and then leave us with an infinite money supply? Uh, hopefully, you can remember your monetary equation of exchange and know then that if MV equals PQ and we had an infinite money supply, uh, we would have... Um, an infinite increase in nominal GDP, and we would have hyperinflation, which is the answer to number six. Number seven, if the Fed wants to increase the money supply, should it raise or lower the reserve requirement? Hopefully, you, now that you see that it should lower the reserve requirement, so then banks would have more to loan out. Uh, if the Fed increased the reserve requirement in question eight and the velocity remained stable, what would happen to nominal GDP? And uh, if uh, the Fed does that, the money supply would decrease. Why is that? The nominal GDP will decrease uh, based on that monetary equ equation of exchange, MV equal PQ. So if uh, M decreases and V stays constant, then uh, PQ, or nominal GDP, has to decrease. Uh, the economic goal of the Federal Reserve in reducing the money supply would, would be to achieve stable prices, which is what we should have written there. One of the key functions of the U.S. Federal Reserve is to maintain price stability. And then last question, why might the money supply not expand by the amount predicted by the deposit expansion multiplier? We can have a few reasons for this. Um, banks, for example, they may not be able uh, to loan out uh, all their excess reserves for you know, reasons that each individual bank might have. They may be very cautious about the future and want to have, hold more in reserve. They can do that if they'd like, um, and so they, so they might want to do that. Um, and uh, likewise, too, not all the money uh, might be uh, uh, deposited into the banking system. You know, we, we as, as people may hold a little bit of that. Uh, money in, in on our persons uh, uh, and in our wallets and in, in our purses. So that's the answer then to number 10. Uh, I am very hopeful that these videos are helping my classes uh, make their way through some of these very difficult handouts. Um, if you have any further questions, again, feel free to email me and uh, I'll answer you just as quickly as I can. We'll see you soon.